and gentlemen, welcome to the April meeting of the Somerset Council Executive. Um, just wanted to say at the start just how moved I was by the opening of the Knife Angel in Taunton last week and to particularly thank the Barnaby Webber Foundation Stand Against Violence, Taunton Town Council for their support with, with that project and thank Councillor Smith Roberts for her leadership on that. I hope it has a profound effect. Really pleased to see the education work by Stand Against Violence. I've worked with them on many occasions in my teaching career. They're really, really great organisation. Uh, anyway, um, so welcome to this meeting of the executive. Um, just go for, through the formal um, preamble. It's only executive league members present in the room that are taking the decisions in this meeting. Others in attendance are here to provide advice to the executive and the agenda and the papers have been published on the council's website in advance of the meeting and there will be a recording of the meeting and this will be published in due course. Um, can I further highlight that we're using a hybrid format for this meeting. Uh, ex all executive lead members and key officers are physically present here in the John Meekle room at Dean House in Taunton, but other elected members and officers may physically or remotely join the meeting to speak on specific agenda items or to observe. And the meeting is being broadcast and therefore other members of the public and partners can observe the meeting remotely. Um, if you are online, please can you only use the chat function for the purposes of this meeting um, and primarily to indicate that you wish to speak, though I do prefer um, that you use the hands up function if you are able to do so. And can you please only speak at my invitation and say your name before speaking um, when you are not speaking? Um, can you ensure that microphones are turned off and cameras as well as that as helps? with our bandwidth. Um, apologies for absence. I have apologies from Associate Lead Member yes. uh, Ollie Patrick. Other apologies. Nothing being indicated. Thank you. And from officers, we Got Alan Jones being deputised by Sarah Crackney and Executive Director Climate and Place, Mickey Green. Uh, minutes of the meeting held 6th of March and 12th of March. Oh, sorry, Councillor Adeshera. Thank you. Just to say that um, Claire Winters sends her apologies also, but I'm supported offline by uh, online by um, Jane uh, Shelbourne Barrow. Ah, oh, right. Yes, sorry. I've just seen, seen a note on my, on my my agenda that says that. So thank you. Thank you. I've missed that one. <laughs> Um, and so we're back to the minutes of the previous meeting, um, 6th of March and 12th of March. Do I need to take those separately? Yeah, so first of all, 6th of March, can I see any problems or concerns for 6th of March? Proposer, Councillor Lyshon seconded, Councillor Shearer, those in favour, those against, that's clearly carried. And the 12th of March, any problems or issues with those minutes? Proposed. Seconded, those in favour, those against. That's clearly carried. Thank you very much. Are there any declarations of interest in today's agenda that aren't listed elsewhere, particularly membership of city, town and parish councils? Not seeing any, which brings us to public question time. Uh, do we have Mr. Regwell online? He did email me this morning and I can see him. Yeah. Good yeah, morning, David. Here. Good morning, David. Good morning. Bill. Um, um, so, 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 David, I understand your question doesn't directly apply to an agenda item, but because I'm, I'm, I'm in a kind of generous mood, we've allowed it. Um, you're, you're, as we, you're very as kind, we will generally Bill, do, unless we unless I we think we're trying to be helpful to the council as well, really, in um, trying to find a way forward. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much, so, David. Uh, my question really is about restructuring. Um, <laughs> I've been through some of this in Dorset, and it's never easy um, going from the Dorset districts into Unitary Dorset and Bobblethall and Christchurch. Of course, there were job losses and of course, unfortunately, it was also early uh, retirement, um, which is an answer to some of this. But the other thing is to try and bring together services. And what we're noticing in transport, and I'm a member, as you know, of your Somerset Bus Advisory Board, um, is we're still working, Bill, with a very fragmented system, um, silo working. So an example of Yeovil bus station, which should be treated as a whole, um, 
got decisions being made on toilets and waiting rooms. And yet, as I spoke to the leader of the Town Council, we could be in a position there to bid for government money and government grant for our bus service improvement plan. And I've worked very successfully with Cheltenham Council and with South Gloucestershire to get changing places money, also in New Quay. Um, that's for uh, toilets which can be uh, disabled accessible and this government grant. Um, so as we're just working in silos and the government saying that for bus station changes we should have a plan as part of we shouldn't be closing any of them uh, that's government policy not mine um i'm just really asking that how quick the restructuring is going to take bill to bring like a director of bus stations and infrastructure in place i know that's difficult because it will mean some people lose their jobs in the four units four districts that previously did some of the function but it's cost saving but it's also allowing frontline services to be maintained so probably it's just asking what work is in progress there. And I think we'd be very happy as partners to see any uh, restructuring of the transport department makes it more efficient, like transport for Devon or transport for Cornwall. Um, and I think the other thing is with Yeovil, we've had correspondence, if we could try and have a meeting with partners, because there may be solutions from first, from Southwest Coaches, from Dorset Council, the rail industry, towards helping to find a solution for that bus station. Um, and I, I think probably towards a slightly different issue, um, although obviously I'd say keep them open wherever you can, but on the bus stations, I'm very keen we don't lose money on our bid on the 12th of June. And Mark Harper's now taken quite a big interest in you. Know, interesting, uh, but the MPs have got involved. Um, so that's my question, really. How quick can we get the restructure? It's never going to be easy closing buildings and shutting down resources. Dorset have done it. Um, Baines did it when they first came about. Um, Cornwall's done it, and so has Wiltshire and Swindon. So um, not easy. I wish you well with it. But I think if we can get a cleaner, cleaner structure in position in Somerset, we're always going to need government grant. We need more of a government grant for local authorities. I hope a new government will consider that and make sure they understand local government. But it's about how the structuring and can we please have a transport department that probably does what it says on the tin and manages the services that form the district. So that's my question, Please. really. OK, thanks so much, David. Uh, I think uh, Richard's going to res respond to your question as written but thanks ever so much for the extra extra points around it as well which are, are all, all well made and well received thank you david and call on councillor wilkins to respond um thank, thank you david um, um as you know we, we always listen to our partners especially in the somerset bus partnership who always have a, an interesting take on things and uh, something to, to mull over but um Taking sort of both your written questions together as they're kind of closely aligned, um, the existing bus service improvement plan sets out our aspirations for improving passenger facilities. But we have always been clear that these asp aspirations are subject to funding. Thus far, we have not received the level of funding from government to deliver all the aspirations and have prioritised investment in bus service provision and reliability. To clarify the position, the submission of the updated bus service improvement plan in June 2024 does not represent a funding bid to government on this occasion, but will again set out our ambitions subject to funding. We are following government guidance on this submission and will meet the deadline um, for it. Um, as you will be aware, we need we need to make some very difficult decisions in recent months to to set a budget a balanced budget. Those decisions include the closure of public toilets because of the cleaning and maintenance cost. Some town and city and parish councils are stepping in to keep some of these facilities open. Once devolved, like this Somerset Council passes control to the other organisations and they would be managed as best that all that that organisation sees fit. So there isn't a role for us. We have had discussions with Yeovil Town Council, but they are not currently in a position to take on responsibility for the facilities at the town's bus and coach station. Um, 
Thank you for your comments regarding restructuring. It is vital that Somerset Council moves forward to a long term financial sustainable position to deliver the vital services. Bringing together five complex organisations takes time. Uh, we, we are still in the process of aligning some because we don't have the resources to do everything at once. I have asked officers to take a detailed look at the bus and coach infrastructure over the next year so that we will be in a better position to move forward. In terms of car park fees, your notes from the decision taken by executive on the 6th of December 2023 that surplus parking income is being used to support Taunton Park, Taunton Park and Ride. We will continue to evolve our use of income where available to best support the needs of the travelling public. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Wilkins. And thank you, David, for your question. I think the, the, the additional point on changing places, toilets has also been been noted and we'll see what we can we can do to resolve. Thank you very much, uh, Leader of the Council. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. OK, that brings us to the executive forward plan. Um, so this is on published on the council website and the link was available in the documents are there any comments from associate or lead members on the forward plan not seeing anything any from other members so that's for noting which we don't need a resolution for okay which brings us on to item six which is developing the approach to transformation of future council and i'd uh, like to invite councillor theo but philip to introduce the item and highlight any key points thank you theo thank you very much um this report updates the executive on the progress made over the past month in developing and implementing our approach to the whole council transformation we will be bringing forward reports regularly over the coming months as the programme develops to update the executive on progress and changes of approach. As articulated in the report, the approach to transformation is now encapsulated in the improvement and transformation programme, which is also designed to meet the assurance requirements of the capitalisation direction and the requirements to prepare a productivity plan, which has been handed down by government. The programme comprises five key strands, the organisational design, the workforce programme, Innovation and Change Programme, Partnerships, Devolution and Localities Programme and Savings Delivery Plan. In recent weeks, much of the attention has been on the Workforce Programme, but it's important to remember that this is not the only element of the Transformation Programme. Devolution is another strand which has exercised many, both within Somerset Council, within our City, Town and Parish Councils and other partners over the past few months and will continue to do so over the next year. <clears throat> Organisational design, innovation and change programmes and saving delivery plans are also crucial elements. But I will return to the workforce programme. This isn't just about workforce reduction and the current uh, VR programme, although that is a crucial part of how we will bring down the wage bill. The saving from this programme is projected to be the single largest financial saving over 2025-26 and thus a crucial element for the future financial stability of this organisation. This element also includes embodying our organization embedding our organizational values uh into uh the, our culture uh providing support for our staff throughout this program of change and ensuring the right total reward and a fit for purpose job evaluation and pay and grading structure for the future as i've said before but i will never uh shy from the opportunity to say i want to say a huge thank you to our staff who have been undergoing uh, an enormous period of uncertainty over the past few years um this has not been an easy time for them uh they do a fantastic uh job uh under frankly difficult circumstances and i want to put on record again my thanks to them for that Transformation program. Is there a bit of feedback? I think the uh, uh, speaker has just been tweaked slightly. 
Excellent. No, that sounds better. Thank you. <clears throat> Transformation program, however, is not just about addressing the financial emergency. The financial emergency means that we've had to take it further than previously envisaged and do so faster. But it is about building a council which delivers for Somerset and helps us to deliver the priorities of the council plan. Both over the last few months and as we go forward, I want to thank the scrutiny committees, particularly the Corporate and Resources Scrutiny Committee, which is leading on this organisation. Their feedback to date has fed into uh, the programme and it is hugely valuable and I look forward to them engaging with this process as they have done so far and helping to make it a better, uh, better programme for their involvement. I'll now hand over to uh, Sarah Critney, the Service Director for Strategy and Performance, who is joined by Sarah Skirton, Service Director for Localities and Partnerships, Dawn Betteridge, Service Director for Workforce, and Lou Routley, Digital Program Manager, who will take us through the report. Um, thank you, Chair and uh, Councillor Buck Phillip. I'm not going to add a lot more to what um, Councillor Buckfoot's already said, just to say that this, uh, the Improvement and Transformation Programme further refines our approach to transformation and brings together key threads of activity under one umbrella of change so that we can provide a whole organisation overview and prioritisation of time and resources. Recognising the pace, scale and complexity of the transformation and change that is required to deliver our vision and also to support financial sustainability. Um, this is the first in a series of regular reports to executive that will set out the progress that we're making. Um, as has been said, there are five key component parts to the Improvement and Transformation Programme. The report goes through each of these in detail, setting out what they are and then the progress to date. Uh, I'm not intending on going through that in detail, but to create time for questions from myself and my colleagues, Dawn, Sarah and Lou. Thank you, Theo, and thank you, Sarah. Just looking around executive members and associate league members, I've got Heather first and then Dixie. <coughs> Thank you so much. It's really good to see this. Um, and I'm pretty sure we're going to be seeing a lot more reports, not like this, but on this theme and, and unpacking the details we go through. I just had a question, if you wouldn't mind, um, and forgive me if I've missed it in the report, because it might be me um, having read the report a while ago. But on the um, Appendix C, which is the governance timeline, it makes reference there to having terms of reference and schedule of meetings um, to be defined. That's for the cross scrutiny working group. I just think scrutiny is such an important thing um, for this and for, for all the members in the uh, in the council to be aware of. So forgive me, but are we do we have a timeline for when those meetings might be um, being set up and the terms of reference in place? And I say, forgive me if I've missed it in the report. Thank you for you, Chair. Um, so we so we haven't got a timeline yet. So that's we had a scrutiny briefing, um, and what we agreed at that scrutiny briefing was that we would set up a, a working group and with clear terms of reference and a timeline throughout. That's work in progress, but we will of course let you know as soon as that's set up. Thank you. Okay, Dixie Councillor Darch. Um, thank you. Uh, it's good to see. I mean, this is such a difficult thing isn't it really it's good to see a kind of holistic approach that it's not just about losing staff it's looking at the organization as a whole and um kind of what what we're about um and uh, i was also reassured to see the scrutiny comments in the report as well and um, appreciate their desire to be kept updated as we progress through this my question is really around um on page 43, Appendix A, uh, around um, the, the risks about um, kind of losing organisational knowledge. And I think um, there's a line in there about have a process to capture and retain organisational knowledge. And I, I think there's that tension between 
the need to move at pace and the need to like make sure we don't rush so much that we lose really valuable knowledge so I'm kind of just wondering how that what that process is likely to look at and, and you know when kind of when people leave how how are we going to kind of capture that knowledge that is there and not elsewhere not not written down thank you Thank you, uh, Councillor Dutch and uh, Chair. Um, you know, I'd like to uh, just pass over to my colleague, Dawn Bettridge, uh, to answer this one. Thanks, Dawn. Um, thank you for the question. Sorry, and we're just going to sort out. We've got a little bit of a mic technical issue. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious you won't be able to see me on the screen, um, but very happy to uh, answer the question. Um, with regard to knowledge transfer, it's going to be really important that with anybody that's leaving the organisation that holds a wealth of, of knowledge and skills that we bake into the programme a systematic way of, of trying to capture that appropriately. So this will be very much led by each individual service director um, with support from the organisational development team. Um, and so it's it's a one size fits all approach doesn't really apply here. It's going to very much depend on the nature of the skills and knowledge that's needed to be captured. But just to assure you that we have got a programme around supporting people through change and organisational development that will support managers in that task. Clearly, we won't be releasing anybody on a VR uh, application. Um, if if there is a real complexity with skills and knowledge that we're unable to um, uh, unable to support through another member of staff, for example, so it's very much baked into the program. Sarah Wakefield. Um, yes, thank you. Um, and and I also <clears throat> would like to start off by saying I appreciate how much this is a strain for the staff and how difficult it's going to be for them to live through this process, knowing that it's going to end up in a hopefully leaner, more efficient council. But that has certain consequences. Um, my concern is similar to what's been raised already. And I'm looking at page 42 where it says service instability caused by our managed VR high level of CR, which I think is something to do with redundancies, but possible redundancy. Well, redundancy, that's right. Um, and and, and my, my concern is about the service stability. Um, I know that in a report we're going to look at later um, from the Section 115 officer on page 114, he says one of the risks is no clear plan on services to do with the resizing. So I, I would like to be sure that I think I've referred to it referred to in this report the design authority. Um, is going to come up with and what it shows in the timeline, I think a um, target operating model. I think it shows it by the end of May, but something that's going to come up that means that we can be sure that we are going to provide the services that this council must provide. And I, I think that everybody needs that reassurance that we're not going to fall over. And I know other councils have done it and they must have got through it somehow. And it's very difficult, but I think that assurance is something that everybody needs. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll jump in on this one if that's OK. So we will have a target operating model. Um, I think we're still on that timetable. Um, what I would just say is that won't give you assurance. That will give you more assurance. So there will be instability. We are talking about, unfortunately, exiting a large number of colleagues from the, um, from the organisation. There will be some risk. We can't take that risk down to zero. But what you can see from the risk register you referred to is that the steps were taken re reducing the risk. Um, the target, target operating model will reduce it further. Um, what we will have to do in a large degree is just make sure we have that ability within the organisation to deal with any problems that do emerge. And I don't think there'll be a risk of us not delivering our statutory services. I think it will be a period of instability potentially where it is um, not the optimum delivery and it will take a while to get back to that. Thank you, Chair. Following on 
from what um, the, um, the chief exec and, and Councillor Wakefield have said. I'm very aware that other councils have, in not my words, other, other people's words, tied themselves up in knots trying to define what is statutory because the statutory um, requirements are as broad as they are as long in terms of description and interpretation. And I just wondered whether or not we should consider replicating the incredible amount of work we put into making sure that the parishes and the population at large in Somerset understood um, the budget and the way we were going with um, our, our future viability. And I just wondered whether we need to start that conversation about what is genuinely statutory and how we're going to interpret it in some way, because I think that there is a lot of misunderstanding um, among ourselves, let alone the general population, and we've got to find a way to communicate the, the lack of clarity in this area. Indeed, I think that extends across the local government sector as well. Um, anyone who's wanted to pick that one up? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm watching, watching Wimbledon here, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Leader. Um, I think there is a piece of work to be done to explain to the public what the standards are we're working to, but I'm probably the worst person to ask that question directly to because I, I think the statutory um, discretionary definitions are really unhelpful. Um, they're, they're virtually non-existent in a meaningful way. So we have to deliver some services. It doesn't say to what standard, doesn't say how. Um, a lot of that's done through case law, good practice, professional standards. So it's a really, really difficult concept to try and work through to a way in a lot of areas in a, to get to a meaningful conclusion. There are a few areas where it is quite clear that if we stop doing that, we could. Um, but there are very few areas where that's true, few and far between. So what we've been trying to work through is say we need to understand where we want to take conscious decisions to close things down or to reduce the level of service. And then in other areas, we will need to be saying to people, actually, this is the level of resource we've got. Let's have that conversation when we know the answer to that and work out what the service looks like going forward. And that'll be part of the operating model to make clear that we've got service plans in place that will say to people, these are the standards we expect to deliver to. Because that's not a statutory, non-statutory definition. I think a lot of that needs to be co-produced with the public as well, in exactly the same way we worked with um, city, town, parish councils on the devolution piece, and we'll keep doing so. We need to talk to our customers, our residents, about what the service standards are within the resources we've got available as we actually get into that level of definition. I'm not seeing any of the lead members or associate lead members who wish to speak, so go to opposition, oh, sorry, other members in the room. Um, I've got Faye first, and then Mandy, and then Lee. Do you want to use mine? Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks for, for this report. I think many of the uh, topics that I was going to cover have been um, touched upon already, so I won't go over um, common ground. Some of the questions I have are around um, the outlines on page 30 of the report, particularly around health and wellbeing implications for our staff and looking at um, social value. So on the, on the health and wellbeing side, and it's a topic I've brought up a number of times, we're obviously doing work with our workforce to keep them informed as what's going on with the programme. And I'm sure that's being done in a, a very proactive manner. I just wanted to understand and couldn't see within the report what we're doing particularly for those who may have particular circumstances, protected characteristics, those potentially going on maternity leave or our apprentices who are in a more vulnerable situation um, from their career point of view than some others and might not be engaged on, on a whole um, wholly active basis, especially if they're out of the workforce or those on long-term sick. Um, do you want me to do all the questions at once or do one at a time? Um, how many do you have? Uh, I've got one more on this kind of area and then one do, on the other want, area. Do you want to do the other one on this this area and then we'll we'll take them? Um, and then the other one is around the, the fact that the, um, the document states that there are no social value 
value implications directly from this report. And I think this report is wholly about um, creating a new organisation, which you've, you've said over many occasions is going to be specifically smaller. Um, much of our corporate social responsibility that we attract as a council is through our external contracts and the work that we do. And if we're a smaller council who are spending more, oh, sorry, spending less um, with those kind of organisations, then there will be a direct knock on effect of any corporate social responsibility um, value that is coming into the organisation. So I think to say there are no implications is perhaps um, either an oversight or naive in looking at how our smaller spending will affect that. OK, so I think the first part of the question, I think it's going to go to Dawn Bertridge to answer. Uh, thank you, Lisa. So just in response to the question about the health and well-being implications for our staff, um, what we've actually done there in order to target staff. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'll carry on on this mic for now. Um, what we've actually done so far is we've um, done a, a very big workshop across the HR function to look at the different groupings of staff and how staff are going to be affected. And so what we're doing is just to make sure that we've identified all the different personas or groupings, the protected characteristics, and then looking at how we're going to target support for each of those groupings as such. So that programme is being put together. Um, it's just being refined and finalised at the moment. And um, I should have something to share. Maybe I could share something offline just to update you with what we've done so far. I'd be happy to do that. OK, second part of the question. Do you want to take it? Yeah, thank you very much. So in terms of the social value comments, they are specific to this report and the recommendations in this report. So it is correct. There are no social value implications from this report and its recommendations. Absolutely accept that there will be all sorts of different social value implications as we work through the whole process and contracts change, relationships change, new partnerships are made. I would hope in terms of doing the work, we can actually generate more social value than we currently do. Because I think as councillor quite rightly highlighted, a lot of the social value in the way we capture it comes out as from contracts that we've let. Actually, we could leverage a lot more from the partnerships that we're working with people in the future if we chose to do that. So I would hope there'd be more rather than less, but just to be clear, the commentary in section in paragraph 20 on page 30 um, is correct. There are no social value implications from the recommendations in this report. Um, I think Adam Dance is the purveyor of microphones currently. Um, oh, I would didn't take it. <laughs> I'd like to say it wasn't Adam who took it away from me. So. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so my next question is really around um, the appendix that other colleagues have um, touched on and the fact that there's no mention of the risk of people leaving whilst we are doing whatever we're doing. We talk about um, the loss of knowledge through um, VR or, or CR and, and various other things, but there will be those within this organisation who will be looking to leave because they don't want to wait around until we figure out what we're doing. And it strikes me as irresponsible that there isn't a risk related to that. In any organisation that is restructuring, you will lose good people. Um, and I cannot see that risk. Um, and then just one more comment really um, around the, the items on page 35 and the partnership working. I'm just interested to know what progress has been made on the Somerset Charter and the other SLCC and SOLG recommendations that were made as part of the unitary business case as to how we would be um, working with our communities. Is that charter still under development? Is it something that will be rolled out as part of this transformation programme? And if not, are Sulk and SLCC happy that we've walked away from those um, suggestions? Thank you. Um, Dawn Beckridge for that one. Thank you, Chair. Um, just in response to the question around the risk of people leaving now, on page 42 in the document, I think there is quite a high level risk outlined um, around excessive loss of talent and organisational knowledge. So that's not specifically around um, 
just one particular thing, but so we can definitely extend that within future reports if, if that's required. Okay. What I would say is that we're tracking turnover on a monthly basis now. and We're also conducting exit interviews for those staff who are choosing to leave the organisation at the moment outside of the current schemes that we have running. Um, and that information is being shared back to service directors so they can actually see, you know, what the impact actually is and the reasons why people are leaving. Then what we're doing centrally is monitoring what trends are coming through on those exit interviews to see if there are other reasons that people are leaving the organisation other than the obvious um, and to make sure that, again, we can target intervention where it's necessary to do so. And we can also speak to people, you know, when they resign, not when they leave. I think that's really important as well, that we capture that early on. Um, and if it's somebody that, that clearly, you know, there might be something we can do to mitigate or stop them from leaving the organisation, if that's the right thing to do, then we will make those interventions early. Thank you. And I was hunting for the answer for the first question, which was so ably given by Dawn. I missed your second question. I'm really sorry. The, the, the second question. Lisa Charter, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, who's going to pick that one up, Sarah? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, the relationship with Salk and SLCC continues and we continue to develop it. We meet regularly with them. Um, the Charter, we've definitely not walked away from it. I would say that perhaps the devolution discussions have taken precedence in the short term and there have been personnel or there are personnel changes at Salk, which we are obviously linking closely with them on. It is certainly still on my service to do list. Um, and we will weave it into the, the partnerships and devolution localities element of the programme. Thank you. You know, paperless meeting, there are so many papers. Uh, Mandy next. Thank you. For that. Um, thank you. Our first question really is, um, I suppose a challenge around the key risks. When I look at the mitigated RAG statuses of almost every risk identified in this paper, they all feel very low. Um, and if I pick out, for example, the first one, non-delivery of medium term financial plan savings, consequence savings not achieved, 15. It will be catastrophic if the savings are not achieved. The council will struggle to move forward. And then you've got a mitigated RAG rating of eight. Now, I've not seen uh, medium term financial plan wise anywhere showing 15 and eight. And I know you've just said we're just looking at this paper, um, but um, this this paper will go on to do other things. And I'm just concerned by looking at the risk risks here in isolation of what else is going on in the council so my my question is how have you got to mitigate it of eight on non-delivery of mt uh, and financial planning and savings when we all know the struggle we're having and that's exactly why this paper's here today so that's my first question uh, uh liz lyshon will take that one thank you thank you uh, thank you chair thank you mandy um I know that you and I've spent many years now looking at risk on MTFP and uh, I suspect we always will. I can't see a time when we will stop doing that as uh, councillors for Somerset. Uh, I just wanted to say that the work that is being done on setting up the performance risk and budget monitoring board, I think needs to look across all of these papers, as you suggest. So um, I see different risk uh, matrix in different papers. And I think one of the really good actions that we can take as we're into this financial year now is to work together much better across those papers, across the directorates, so that we have um, continuity of how we present the risks, the, the, um, the actual risk and the mitigated risk, how we colour and also uh, use text for those who are colour blind because that's been an issue, hasn't it, in audit. So I think that is a significant piece of work to do, and I think it will it, it will give us a much better overview when we when we have a way of working on Q3 
key risk strategic risk that runs across all of that reporting. So yeah, I, I welcome your your challenge and um, and I think we are already working just not working on it fast enough, but it's definitely on our to do list and it's for me it's right at the top because if risk is not at the top now, it never will be. Thank you. Thank you. And for me, it's about consistency and that is not consistent with what we're seeing elsewhere. And we need to be honest. Um, second question really is around the rabbit hole of statutory. I do think the dialogue needs to move on from calling it statutory and non-statutory because it is such a grey area. I think we need to stop talking in statutory, non-statutory terms. Um, and we need to start talking about outcomes and what our residents are going to see moving forward. I just leave that there as a, a statement, Chair, because it's getting slightly frustration to keep hearing it. It's, it doesn't mean much because statutory has such a broad range uh, within it. So I'll just leave that as a comment from me. OK, it's a it's a it's a comment I'm, I'm so 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 itchy to come back on because I think there is I think there is a broader debate. And on, you know, when I speak to, to council leaders from all, all, all political complexions, I think there is there's a need for a discussion as to what local government is and isn't for. Um, and I, I'll, I'll leave that there if that's OK, <laughs> uh, Lee. I think we're agreeing. <laughs> Chair, thank you. Um, most of my comments have been covered previously, but I just want to make a couple of quick points, if I could, please. Um, the chief executive, when we, talk, we were talking about service provision in, in one of the responses that the, the, the chief executive made a few moments ago, was talking about accepting the fact that things may not be the optimum. Um, it gives me great concern with that, particularly because uh, I'll just put my children and family scrutiny hat on for a second. We've worked very hard over the past years to reach a point now where our service provision is good. My concern is if we're, we, we're putting that at risk because of unknown consequences. Um, I know it's easy for me to sit here and say we, we, you, you can't, uh, we don't know until it turns up and bites us. But the, the concern I have is the fact that if we're accepting that some things will be not optimum, there will be a consequential impact and will in effect impact on previous hard work. Um, the second point is more a matter of uh, Councillor um, uh, Wyke made about the statutory provision and what previous colleagues has made about statutory, but also to pick up on one of the things, Chair, that you've made previously. We've been having conversations with other councils around the country that have been through this. We've been talking about the need to be clear about what is statutory for a long time. And for, forgive me, Councillor, like I'm, I'm not meaning to put that, I'll just take your words. We need to start that conversation now. I would have hoped we already had that, been, been running with that conversation by now because we've been talking about it for a long time. So, so my question, Chair, more about our, why are we not able to voice what is a statutory minimum for a council and how are we going to start making that known to members of the public because there are lots of people criticizing us for what is happening but we could be having a big banner out the front saying this is what we're doing we're doing it we're doing it because of a reason and by the way this is what minimum looks like yeah thank you um leader i think as we alluded to already um councillor it is an unhelpful definition it is not something that there is any agreement on we've seen other councils significantly bigger than this council try and set out what is statutory minimum and fail to do so um so we i think we just need to move away from those terms personally um, i don't think they're helping the conversation what we need to talk about is very much that there is a council in somerset for local people that is worth having when we finished we need to be really clear what it is we're about as an organization and we really need to, re need to be really clear with people particularly those who are using services what the standards are they can expect and that we can be held accountable for um, but I don't think that's couched in that language of statutory and discretionary, I'm afraid. Um, and that's what we'll hopefully start to be able to work towards. Obviously, this is, as the paper lays out, a multi-layered programme. You won't be able to answer all the questions that you'll know the answer to at the end before you start. And we're working through with some of the um, 
easier processes, I won't say they're easy things to do, um, to start with to actually try and help us shape up. So the approach that we're looking for is, I think if I say it's heuristic, you know, we're taking step one, that will give us some better insight in step two. We take step two, it gives us better insight in step three. And that's hopefully what you get from the paper. Um, so I think we will be able to start laying out more clearly where there will be the impact. What is the case, obviously, in the organisation where we're having to take so much resource out of what it currently pays for? Doesn't mean we'll be spending less, by the way, and we'll probably be spending more at the end of the day. Um, but it will mean that there will be some impact on what we've previously built up to uh, across a whole range of different services. What we need to make sure is that we understand those impacts as they arise and we make sure we're comfortable that is an appropriate impact. And if it's not, we're going to have to do something different. I'm just conscious. I, I forgive me. I'm just, I was conscious. I see Councillor White was waving you. I just wanted to clarify, Jen. It wasn't. It wasn't a criticism of what she was saying. It was just picking up the words that I was doing. Uh, but the, if there's anything ad, as leader of one of the opposition groups that I can do to support the, the raising the banner or getting telling people what we can or can't do, that I'm happy to to do that. But I think we need to be doing something, yesterday, rather than tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think there are, there are two audiences for the communication, which is both um, our, our voice nationally, uh, which is at times channeled through the local government association and the council's network, uh, occasionally the, the district council's network, but perhaps not so much. Um, but I think there is also, um, there is, you're absolutely right, there's that piece of communication with our residents as well. Um, Councillor White, you have been named, you have indicated, so I will come to you. I think you probably just defined what I was going to say, that there are two audience. And I do think we have been um, quite vocal nationally, um, as everyone knows, for some time on um, local government, the role of it and the finance. I do think that we need to, having got the message very clearly across and people are playing back to us now, they understand our finances. Now we need to um, work on, and I think um, the Chief Exec has alluded to, that conversation around expectations of what services we're going to deliver in the future. Okay, thank you. I'm not seeing any other indications in the room. So go on, moving on to online. Uh, Councillor Rosemary Woods first. Good morning, Rosemary. Oh, thank, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm getting somewhat confused because the computer told me I'd already spoken, but I didn't remember that. But um, on uh, Councillor uh, Buckphillips... Don't Phillips, worry, Rosemary, we'd have remembered. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Councillor Buck Phillips uh, pointed out that this isn't all about redundancies. Um, my own parishes are still worried about what they're expected to deliver. I know that Stigurzy is still waiting to have clarification on cr crossing patrols um, because I know they put a little bit of money back, but not enough that the school would need if it had to provide that patrol man, that lollipop man. So I want clarification on that. Um, I, I think I probably missed it. I missed some of what uh, Councillor Buck Phillips said, but he said he was concentrating on one area. But this is an area the parishes will want to know about. What are they going to be responsible for and how much is it going to cost them? That is what clearly comes over at parish meetings. Um, you said it was not about staffing just staffing, but you hadn't said anything at all about assets either. And assets, I, we seem to be selling off things we don't actually own yet, things that we've borrowed from. Can you give us any clarification on that? And I apologise if I've gone off track on this one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rosemary, for your question. Theo, yeah, do you want to come back on that one first? Yeah, I'll come back initially. Um, uh, in terms of um, what services parishes, cities, town councils do provide, um, that is still that's still sort of a, a work in progress. If there is a parish that you're particularly concerned about, please do write to me. In general, if there is a parish that's concerned that they don't know what services they're expected to provide, it's because they aren't expected to provide any new services. That's why they haven't heard about them. But if there is a concern, I'm happy to happy to have that dialogue either with the parish or, or with you. 
touching on the particular issue of the Stagurzi crossing patrol, uh, I'm sure that Councillor Wilkins would like to come in, but I'll just uh, I'll save him the trouble and, and just say that that is a saving that I believe we um, we reduced uh, in the in the budget. And um, if that sort of if that service is continuing, then it will continue for the next year and there will be a dialogue if there needs to be any change in the future. Is that correct, Richard Wilkins? Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, roughly correct. But we're, we're, we're very happy to work with all parishes um, to find a solution to any problems. So um, just drop me an email and um, with, with your particular concerns and I'll, I'll work through them. Thank you. Thank you. And I think there was a question on assets that Ros White wants to pick up. When you acquire an asset, you acquire it regardless of how it's funded. And therefore, we are quite clear and we made a decision some months ago that we were going to dispose of assets and this would in turn make an impact on the amount of mo monies we have borrowed and therefore yes we are disposing of assets which we have borrowed against but that's the reality of where we are and the guidance very clearly from central government regarding the um, capitalization directive Mm. Thank you. I'm glad I don't run my house like that. Well, OK. Um, Gwil, next. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, yeah, a few things. Um, I think the, the thing that bothers me the most is that we're being basically forced into this by government, who has a, as we all know, has a very poor view of local authorities. Um, so what I would like to know is, is to what extent we're continuing to liaise with the department over our progress on this and whether we're pushing for any sort of um, loosening of the ties that seem to bind us. And the second point I want to make is, is about the scale and ambition of what we're trying to do, which I don't think can be denied. It's fantastic, but I can't help thinking it's a bit like riding a horse across a river and hoping you could go so fast before you sink. Um, and so we've got a major challenge on our hands to do this very, very quickly. And I think what bothers me is something that was raised earlier about um, what we know and what we don't know. I think we all realise that we haven't really got through the transformation that brings the five councils into one. And we haven't completed that process. So to what extent have we, are we picking up the things that we should be picking up under the original business plan and making sure that they're considered amalgamated or dealt with in terms of this transformation coming forward because i haven't heard anything particularly that's that's looking you know trying to pick the stuff that we we should have done already or is it on track to do uh, particularly in terms of an ongoing vr process because i'm the thing that worries me most is is back to the point about the loss of skills and corporate knowledge that, that will depart with people. And I'm very worried about how we're conducting a VR process without actually having designed what we want to do yet. So there just seems to be a, a gap there that we, we may fall between two stools. Um, and I think the last point I want to make up was, was back on the statutory thing and I appreciate the difficulties around this um, but essentially if we don't get our definition of what represents a statutory service right and we're legally happy with it then either the government's going to start jumping up and down um, or somebody will take us to JR so it, whilst I appreciate it's something we do need to move on for if you, it's got statutory in it somebody will take you on it if they disagree with your point of view so we have to be very, very careful about just what what our definition is. And clearly, as Councillor Revens has said, if we can get all the local authorities to come up with a collective view of this is what we think it means, then you're in a much better position. But I mean, th there is a significant risk around that. I'm not particularly sure there's a, there's questions there. I mean, I, I am concerned about the sort of the ongoing VR before we've really started to design or come up with a final design and, and how we in the risk of losing people um, and people may just choose to go anyway. I mean, but there we are. I mean, it's 
Nobody wants to be where we are, but I'm, I'm very concerned. I will be taking an active part in the scrutiny process over the summer to make sure that we we come out of this at the other end as best we can. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Quill. I think in answer to your first point is, is that active conversations are going on on both an officer and political level with government. We're acutely aware um, that that we all know that there is an election in the next uh, in the in the coming months, which is the context to which those conversations are happening, which makes does make life um, tricky in terms of trying to find longer term solutions. However, we we are I'm sure all of us are doing our best with the best of intentions. Um, on the second point, Theo, do you want to pick that one up? Um, it was around LGR and. Um, business case yeah. being you know, integrated or not into the transformation program. Yeah, I mean, we are we are absolutely trying to pick up everything that was in the business case, but it has become apparent that it, we have to go considerably um, further than that and and faster than that. We cannot simply implement the business case and implement the transition phase and then move on to the transformation phase, which is what might previously been uh, it been envisaged there isn't really the time or the finance to do it we have to do it in a much uh, in a much more rapid um, process that's why the decision was taken to stop the majority of the restructurings uh, late last year in order to enable a much bigger whole council transformation program and the uh, and, and the restructuring of wholesale uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, can I just come back? I, I obviously didn't express myself very well. I think one, one of the things that came out of the original transformation was that things got missed and we, we didn't, they hadn't necessarily been picked up. There were little bits and pieces of jobs, people left, tasks weren't overcome. I think it, it's, it's those little bits and bobs, and hopefully there won't be too many big ones, that suddenly somebody says, oh, what are we doing? Well, should we be doing this? Um, and that's what the original transformation was gradually teasing out. We've got one or two issues in, in, the, in the ward here, uh, but where things have been clearly forgotten corporately, which then get picked up and amalgamated back in. But it, it's the more you do that, the greater the risk of losing something significant. So it's, it's not simply the business plan. It's also the consequences of the business plan as you're working through what you should be doing. I hope that makes it slightly clearer. Yeah, I think I think your point is is, is well made. I, I recall Donald Rumsfeld and the unknown unknowns, um, which is where where we've tried to pick up incidents, which are or or situations, which I think you're alluding to in your patch, but there have been other similar ones around around the county, um, which we've been involved in, and that's that's where the where the, having a, a bit of a backstop of making sure that we've covered those is important, uh, Liz. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make the point about the um, cross path, the select committee that looked at financial distress in local because the government's response has been published now. And it might be that we uh, that I am asking our Section 151 officers to send that to all members because the words that kept jumping out to me time and time again in the response were <coughs> in the next parliament. There were virtually no answers in there that any of us would wish to read, but we ca I, I ran out of fingers for in the next parliament. So I think that point about the general election coming at some point in 2024 is hugely important to us. Uh, thank you, Liz. And uh, next on to Jill Slocum. Good morning, Jill. Good morning, Leader. Good morning, Executive. Um, a lot of what I was going to say has been said, but I just want to air these areas of concern that um, with the VR process, I'd like to talk about the VR process because I think this is very important for our staff. I think it would leave this council insufficiently resourced to deliver the council's future programme in all areas, administration and other areas. Also, as the chair of adults and scrutiny, I know how important it is and I know how, how important our staff are. I think, may I say respectfully, I think the timescales have been far too long. Um, valuable staff now are feeling ex exceedingly vulnerable. Some are feeling they have to leave. Many are saying, I'm going to leave before I'm pushed. Many don't understand. I am. I was relieved to hear that there will be interventions when staff resign. I would like to have some more interventions before staff resign to actually know where staff need to know the very urgent um, uh, 
urgent areas where they are needed. Many staff feel that the job they're doing, well, they won't be needing me. There's, there's a massive confusion out there, massive confusion. And I think we're not dealing with that. We're not dealing with the health and well-being of our staff as efficiently as we could. But I do appreciate it's not an easy one, but I do think we need to actually stop losing excellent staff because if this council is going to succeed, we need to hang on to them. We really do. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Some well made points. I'm looking to Dawn to respond. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor, for your comments. Um, I know the VR programme obviously is a huge concern to everybody here and online and to our staff as well. Um, in terms of um, leaving the council insufficiently resourced, we've agreed with the trade union some very clear decision criteria. This is a business led, council led discretionary scheme that we've not run before that we are controlling very tightly. So we only intend to um, give permission for employees to leave on a VR where it's been very clear that they meet the initial criteria. And that initial criteria is can the post be removed and not replaced? So this is being assessed both by the individual who wants to go and the service director, and there will be a VR panel that will also look at the decisions before anything is confirmed. Um, we also look to see that a cost benefit analysis is completed to establish whether savings can be made within a three year pay payback period. So they're the basic things. And ultimately, we have to look at currently, can that post be removed and not replaced? Um, we didn't do a council wide VR scheme a year ago, so this is an, an is an opportunity for many staff who feel that their role is in lesser demand um, now than it used to be or have personal reasons for wanting to leave the organisation. So it gives those people that feel the time is right to move on from Somerset Council the opportunity to put that request forward and for us to assess that request and also to assess the impact it will have on future service delivery. Um, in terms of the timescales, we've just been working to um, the legal requirements regarding the timescales. So with regard to the VR scheme, as soon as the executive gave us permission to proceed with the scheme, we launched it the following uh, two days following that executive meeting. We've completed a 45 day consultation period. The scheme completed on the 24th of March. Um, and we've had 372 applications as of the closing of that scheme. Um, so I hope that answers some of your questions in terms of the interventions that we're putting in to support staff. As I mentioned earlier, it may be that we need to give this some more attention in the next report. But I think, you know, we have got a work stream that's looking how we support staff and managers through change and an organisational development work stream as well. Um, there are a lot of targeted support that we're going to be giving to staff and managers, and that is already in place where people have been affected by the medium term financial plan implications or any of the devolution or cheapening out implications. So we're working very closely with service directors and staff and targeting that support where it's needed. Um, and we'll continue to do that through the next 12 months as this programme proceeds. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Leader, if I may. Leader, I just yeah, want to say that, I, 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 you know I always do this, I'm sorry, but I just hope that this process can have some, some speed to it, please. Um, you know, really, it, it's so important, really so important. When we get our ship in place, we need to get our workforce in there for the ship to run smoothly. And at the moment, some of them are jumping ship because they don't know which way to run. And that's what we've got to stop. So thank you very much. Thank you. Your, your point is well made and we will move as quickly as the law allows. But you will appreciate the difficulty if we yeah. if we if we end up in any any legal challenge. Thank you. OK, that's uh, all the councillors that have indicated that they wish to speak. Just double checking. Nobody else. OK, so just to reiterate, Theo, thanks to our staff uh, who continue to work hard and perform exceptionally well under the most difficult of circumstances um, at the moment. And we do truly value what happens. And it, you know, we were reflected on the last year, both the chief executive and myself and all in our regular regular um, um, updates to communications um, on what we've achieved in the last year. Um, and we have 
uh, delivered against the council plan so much um, in the context that we're in. Um, there's been a number of comments around that risk around corporate knowledge, I think is really well made. Um, and I think we do need to make sure that that is that is born very strongly in mind as we go through that process. Um, Councillor Redmond very well made the point about communications, both with our residents, but also with governments and the rest of the local government sector to make sure that we land the understanding of what's happening in local government across the country. Um, I also want to highlight just the paragraph about scrutiny. Uh, I think the work of all the scrutiny committees is going to be absolutely crucial in delivering this as well as we can and, and it will be an important factor in mitigating the risks that, uh, that have been pointed out. So really welcome the, the impact and feedback of scrutiny across all the areas, but especially in the corporate scrutiny committee. So moving on to the recommendations, uh, the recommendations are to approve the proposed scope of the improvements and transformation programme, to note the emerging programme timeline and to note the progress made since February 24 and the intention to provide regular update reports to executive. OK, do I see a proposer for that, Councillor Buck Phillip? Do I see a seconder, Councillor Shearer? Those in favour, please. Those against, that's clearly carried. Thank you, everybody, for your contribution to that debate and to those uh, members of staff who've been working so hard on this transformation programme. Uh, so we move on to item seven, uh, the medium term financial strategy, 2526 to 2930. And I'd like to ask Councillor Liz Lyshon to introduce the item and highlight any key points. Thank you, Chair. Um, so it's obvious, isn't it, that this paper is essential in order to keep up the pace and the pressure essential to continue to avoid a Section 114 notice. Uh, with its appendices, the paper will go to full council at the earliest opportunity, so that will either be later this month, April, or the uh, full the annual meeting in May. Um, we know too that the capital programme and the treasury management strategy will be revised due to the impending infrastructure investment linked to the Agritas Gigafactory development on the gravity site as that was agreed in principle at our March, the second March executive meeting. Um, those papers will also need to go to full council for approval as the capital programme and the treasury management strategy are recommended by executive. Um, but agreed by full council and of course scrutiny and audit play a part there too. So we have a lot of work to do this summer uh, and we need to make sure we get all of those papers and all of those meetings lined up correctly. Um, although we are now into the new financial year, we still have many concerns. So um, I've just listed some of them for colleagues. Uh, obviously, the outturn for 23-24, um, and although we're no longer working with lots of sets of accounts, it will be the one set of accounts plus the pension fund. It will, of course, be a complex piece of work this year. Um, concern, of course, about our ability to deliver the savings in the MTFP, particularly in, for, in this year's budget or our ability to find other savings to replace any that cannot be achieved. And that was picked up in the previous paper, quite rightly. Uh, concern of the dedicated schools grant and the accumulated deficit, as with most other upper tier councils, and reading now in the trade press about how different councils are being supported by government there. Um, the pace of the wider and the deeper transformation, as we have already been hearing this morning. Inflation and interest rates, of course, will play a, a very relevant part in um, this financial year and future years, as will the global and the national factors, including the date, as I've already referenced, of the next. Um, and how we locally progress on the work with revenues and benefits, where we're bringing, still bringing the four former district areas together in one system. And we will review, as we agreed uh, back in December, 
uh, to review our council tax reduction scheme that was agreed at full council in December. Uh, and we also need to note that as we now have the government grants shown line by line and clearly identified on the income of our simplified budget, we need to be aware that if we wish to use percentages of budget, for instance, for social care as a part of our overall revenue budget, we need to ensure that we use formats that allow that comparison with previous years. Um, some of the workload of this last year, we really must be sure we don't overlook, particularly the audit committee's huge achievement in approving 10 sets of accounts with just the final set of accounts delegated to the 151 officer and the chair of audit. So I'd like to formally record my thanks to the chair of audit and all members of the audit committee for the phenomenal amount of reading and work that they have completed over the last year. I want to point out as well that our request for the capitalisation direction has been over more than the current financial year because we have understanding that the government's time frame does not match the time frame of a council's budget setting. Uh, also, um, I want to make the point that our Section 151 officers Appendix 5 in this paper is critically important to the future of this council. How that work is reviewed and updated as we go through the coming months, the year, will give us assurance or not. It is a critical paper. I thank Jason for agreeing to update that paper on a regular basis. How often that needs doing, whether it's monthly, quarterly, uh, I'll leave to 151 officer to decide, but we absolutely do need those regular updates. Um, there are things that I really hope we will achieve early in this financial year, including incorporating the LGR savings from the one Somerset business case into the transformation plans and the current and future budget so that we no longer need to keep referring to those savings in addition to the much greater savings we need now. Uh, and we will as we will be agreeing to a September update of the MTFP. I would really hope that by the time we get to that September paper that we stop referring to the LGR savings and we talk instead about the overall savings and transformation of this council. And then I've also referred already this morning to how we work on strategic risks, how we incorporate that work with performance and budget monitoring, and then being absolutely clear on the implications of those risks and the actions that are necessary uh, for us to take. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Jason as our 151 officer for more detail, and I want to thank Jason, Nicola and the whole team for moving so swiftly from budget setting to this latest MTFS paper. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so one week into the new financial year, six weeks since you set the budget at full council and we're bringing a financial strategy paper to you. Uh, traditionally, we'd have done this in about July time. So we are, you can see the pace at which we're having to do things now, recognising the challenges we face. I'm just going to pull out a few things from the report. So on the recommendations on page 52, I can just focus on those a second. Getting uh, the executive to uh, look at the actual financial strategy and the savings targets themselves for 25, 26. And you'll see we've got a range in there. Um, between 47 million and 116 million across the various areas. Recommendation that we continue to operate as if a section 114 had been issued and adopt that approach, but take all actions necessary to avoid issuing a section 114. That you receive an update in September on the progress, the updated forecast of where we are with things. Um, Recommendation D about actively campaigning for the reform of local government funding and local freedoms and flexibilities. 
that's not just about the size of funding coming into local government. I think it is widely recognised that the system is broken and not working very well. I think we have to be realistic that any new government is not likely to get around to sorting that out for 25, 26. It's going to take a bit longer. But there are some things in there. We receive over 200 separate grant allocations. That could be a lot more simplified. It's things like that that would make life a lot easier. Um, and recommendation e about the financial control boards. We put those in place about six months ago to have that impact on the current year's budget at the time, the 23-24 budget. We did see as a result of that a significant reduction in the forecast overspend. So it has been effective. There are some tweaks to how that works, uh, not fundamental changes, but more practical changes of how we operate those going forward. And I think they have improved financial management across the organisation. And I think this organisation is very aware of its financial circumstances. Um, and I think that's really important. In, in terms of the report, there's only a couple of things to really pull out, I think. In page 59, paragraphs 40 and 41, talk about the targets for 25, 26, and that range of 47 million pounds to 116 million. And that's trying to cover our gap of just under 104 million pounds forecast gap for 25, 26. And on pages 60 to 62, there's a bit more detail on those areas of search. There's quite a lot of activity below those key headings, and we obviously have quite a busy process through the budget next year all the way till February budget setting at, at, at Council. If I turn on to the appendices and just quickly run through those, on page 73, appendix one is the high level medium term financial plan and the underlying key assumptions behind that. We will update that for September. Um, clearly, you will see from there, one of the biggest challenges we face is not just making savings, it's our increasing costs. That is our biggest problem. Our costs are going up by more than our income. If our costs weren't going up by as much, we wouldn't have such a big financial problem. So focusing on those pressures that we face is a key part of the process. Appendix two on page 79 is a bit of a summary of the key financial achievements. I thought it was worth just setting some of those out because we kind of get on with the next problem. Um, We've been in existence as an authority just over a year. We sometimes forget the things we've done. Um, we have put in a new financial system, moving from five separate ones into one in a very quick timetable. Um, we have closed 10 sets of accounts during the year. Um, that's 10 years worth of work for audit committee. And I know some of the members have felt that at times. They have been very long agendas. And I apologise, but we, we have worked through those. To give you a context on that, there's only 64 sets of accounts for 22, 23 completed nationally. So 21% of councils. There are six county councils. We were the second county council to have our accounts signed off. And I do mean county council because it is 22, 23. There are 25 districts currently completed. We are three of those, and the fourth one should be done fairly shortly as well. So we are in an amazingly good position in terms of all of that. That has taken a lot of work. Also within Appendix 2, and this went to audit committees, our assessment against the SIP for FM code. It's not a legal requirement to do this, but it is good practice. Um, we have done it quite high level, and I would say it's been done by finance rather than across the organisation. We would look to change that going forward. But I think it picks up on the areas where we need to do more work. There is an action plan behind that. It's mainly around our medium term financial planning across the whole organisation that we need to pick up on things. That's reflected in the transformation part conversation we've had earlier, actually. On Appendix 3, the financial control boards on page 87. So proposing to continue to keep those in place across the board to keep tight grips on our establishment, on our spend, etc., but making them a bit more practical as to how they work. We have learned quite a lot by going through that process, and I am seeing more and more councils now adopting this across the board. I know of at least sort of 20, 30 councils have asked for copies of this from me and are doing it. We're all sharing best practice across the piece. Appendix 4 is a bit of a summary of uh, risks. We touched on that again this morning actually um, 
just to sh kind of show the work that's been done going into LGR across the current year. I think it's fair to say on risk there is still more to do going forward. I think as an area in terms of our financial management process, there is some good foundations, but there's quite a lot to be to do better, I would say, as an organisation. Then Appendix 5 is my assessment as the 151 officer in respect of a Section 114 notice. Um, you'll see if you've read that through, there's quite a lot of factors in there I need to take into account. It can change quite quickly. Our position is, I would say, precarious at times. You know, if we, we, we don't have the ability to cope with big shocks to the system, so it's important we have those early warnings and be aware of everything that's going on. So I hope that's helpful in giving members a, a clear view as to what my thinking is and where I see some of those sort of key risks and some of those key issues. So I hope that's a helpful introduction to the paper, Chair. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jason and Heather, first up. Thank you very much and thanks to the report. It's, um, it, the report and all the appendices is, is full of, of fantastic detail and full of things to be picking up on and, and I really appreciate both this is introduction and yours as well, um, Jason, in terms of picking some things out because it made me feel a bit better because I'm thinking I'm, I'm on. You've picked out some of the things that I was quite interested in and they, they tend to be sitting in the appendices. So, um, for instance, there's a couple of things and they're kind of related, I expect, but I'd like to hear what what your answers are about them. In, in Appendix 2, where you're talking about the one that, that jumped out of me, not because it was read, because of what it was talking about, was 2E, that's on page 80, talking about management style and the, the financial management style supporting financial management in the organisation, which at this point has been, you know, obviously rated as read. So one is around how confident are we feeling that we're making a change to our, our management style across the whole board to actually support financial management. And that might have something to do with my next kind of um, comment, which is around Appendix 3, which is on, on the financial control boards and the financial control measures you've talked about, which are obviously great. Um, the um, the no PO, no, no pay element is something, of course, as you can imagine I sit in children's, I'm kind of interested in that. Um, because we perhaps haven't always worked in that way. So it just, it's just a bit of a night, as a, as a temperature check, I was just wondering what proportion of our kind of transactions, I mean, I'm not a rough guide, how far we've got with the no PO, no pay issue. Because one's a very kind of a, a wide question, one's a very detailed one. Because um, I guess the last question is about, if we did this in a year's time, you know, how, what would that colour change? How, you know, how, how if we reassessed ourselves again? And and I love the idea. I'm sorry, I've, I've got the mic, so I'm not going to shut up. The um, the, the idea. Uh, there's a, a phrase within children's and adults, the social care one, which is you know, safeguarding is everybody's business. Well, actually, financial management is everybody's business. This MTFP or MTF, MT, I know, I always want to get MTFP. The MTFS belongs to all of us, and it's our all of us here. It's our job to all bring it home. So it's that, yes, yeah, why question around financial management or our management style supporting it? A little bit more about how we're getting it with POs and then just how comfortable are you feeling projecting forward? Yeah, so I, I think in terms of the management style, the, the basics, the fundamentals are there in within some services. It's really operating well. People are very aware of their budgets. They understand their responsibilities. There's been quite a lot of training. They're very skilled. In some other areas, that's not quite the case. So I think I couldn't do anything else but score it red because it's not consistent. It is my key point. It's not consistent across the piece. I would expect that to change and at least be amber, hopefully green this time next year in terms of the things we're doing, the things we're putting into place. You have to also view this in the context of we have technical term, smash five councils together and five budgets together into one. So at, at times it's been quite difficult for people to actually understand their budget this year. And by the way, we've put in a new finance system over the top, which nobody knew, and the budgets aren't all quite in the right place. So that explains the sort of context is, is quite an important part. They always say you should use a sort of good crisis as a way of sort of changing the behaviours and that, and no PO, no pay is kind of one of those. We have tried in the past to change that, not that successfully in some areas. Um, I think the financial control boards have had a real change on that. We are seeing the percentages go up um, quite significantly because the majority was 
where people didn't do it, particularly in children's, if we're honest about it, was one of the worst areas. We have got a number of projects in that area um, where we're changing it. And that's good news all around. Not only does it improve our financial control, actually for our suppliers, it means we're paying them quicker. So actually, if we get the system, not only do we get better financial management, our suppliers get paid a lot quicker as well. So it, it's a win-win, and we are seeing quite a lot of progress in that in the in the last few weeks, in particular. Thank you. Richard, before Ros, if that's okay. Um, thank, thank you, Jason. It's good to see you smiling. Um, always, it's, it's, it's always a worry to me when you when you haven't got a smile on your face. But um, um, I, was, I was I was interested in um, uh, and forgive me if I've missed it in your report um, about the two hundred odd grants um, and your wants to maybe simplify that mm -hmm. down. Um, do you have anything to sort of um, to suggest? First of all, how much it, it is costing us to, to to bid for these grants, and the amount of time and effort that our um, officers have to put into them, and, and how much what your opinion a simplified version would potentially save the council. It's it's very hard to put a figure on that, and the grants do vary in their nature. So some are at the and when you're bidding for them, and it's a competitive process, and you either win them or don't win them. Um, some are just grants that are given to you as, as a standalone grant. So they do, they do all vary. Um, the different government departments have a very different approach. Um, so I particularly enjoy dealing with the Department of Health. I'm not looking at Mel because they like returns every two weeks on monitoring stuff. So in terms of our resources, that's a huge amount of thing. And I kind of think, and what difference does it make? You know, what are they doing with that information I'm giving them? And if I didn't give them, would the Department of Health suddenly send an emergency team down to Somerset and say, hey, crikey, you didn't fill in a piece of paper to say how you were spending your money? I'm not sure they would, actually. So I think across the whole of government, you'd see some more efficiencies from them. And this is acknowledged by civil servants as well, um, as well as in the authority. So it, it's hard to put a number on it, but on certain ones, we are putting in a lot of resources in kind of feeding that sort of corporate beast that is central government in terms of some of those returns. Some of the other departments are, are a lot better at it, but I think Department of Health in particular are, are really difficult. Um, so I, I would estimate we free up somewhere at least one FTE, if not towards two. Now that's parts of people, so it's not whole people, but it means they can be doing other things as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor White, Ross. Thank you. Um, before I move on to another matter, I would just to say that even when a grant is awarded, as we know to our costs in regeneration, it requires considerable, and I mean weeks of effort, to actually then provide all the additional data before we get a sniff of the money. And I, I mean that very seriously. I mean, if you think of the amount of work put into the 9.6 million um, for um, phosphate mitigation or the amount of money for the 20 million, which is going into the Tone Dale um, project. I mean, it's weeks and weeks of officer time and that's post getting the, the grants. It is recognised nationally. It is the most inefficient way. We've been fortunate. We've we've won a number of competitive bids, but we still spent tens of thousands of pounds in officer time and external consultants to provide the initial bid. And when we haven't succeeded, and I know to my cost at Mendip, um, we failed in two of the levelling up bids, and it took fifty thousand pounds out of our budget to fail. And that just seems to me a and not a most effective way. And I think the civil servants feel uncomfortable about it too. So hopefully going forward, um, that will be um, resolved. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Oh, I've got Sarah next. Liz, that's okay, Sarah. Um, yes, thank you. Um, 
Well, I, I wanted to just make the point about, you've already been making the point about how we get work uh, money by tender to government grants. But the other thing is the settlement, isn't it? We want a longer term settlement because otherwise planning is so difficult. I just want to make that point publicly. We need more than one year and we need it before the end of the year as we get it at the last minute. And it makes planning extremely difficult. So that's my first point. My second point, which I'm sure you'll agree with that, Jason, my second point is to do with how we estimate going forward. As far as adults are concerned, it's a, it's a huge spend. We all know that. Most of it is spent on the care we actually provide. So it's the care provision in various forms, care homes, care packages, all the rest of it, 90%. However, when we get something like the living wage, which we thought was going to be £11.14, is now £11.44. Great, that's fantastic. I'm so pleased for all those people. And it's a lifeline for them. And it's not enough either. But it costs an extra £5 million for us. You know, just look at those figures. They are huge. And that if you impose that on a council without telling them it's coming, without giving them any extra money, you cannot make the budget work. So I just want to make that point. We need longer term settlement and we need it to be realistic when it comes to the sort of care we're being asked to provide. In those estimates we've got going forward, in the budget we've got for this year, there is no wriggle room. So all we need is some catastrophic thing to happen. It could even just be a very needy family moving into the into the county and it just throws the budget out. So I just want people to remember that. I will answer questions about our budget and why it costs so much till the cows come home. But I just need people to understand the size of it and what happens. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, did you want to respond on that, Jason? Yeah, to, just to add, in terms of that longer term financial settlement, that is something the LGA have been campaigning for for a number of years to get that. And it's something across the sector I think everybody supports. Um, I think if you speak to business colleagues and say, by the way, we're setting a billion pounds budget. Um, we're doing it in sort of mid mid February. We've got to publish the papers. We've got to do all the consultation on it. And they say, when do you know what you're going to get? We get a rough idea early December, confirmed sometime the end of January. They think you're nuts. They do, seriously. They think it's mad. The, si the system doesn't quite work. And things like the national living wage that are announced nationally, and not necessarily fed into the figures, or all part of that. The whole system needs a bit of a fundamental rethinking. Liz. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make a point following Heather's comment on page 80, section two, number E, and the financial management style. This is something that when I first saw this paper, I picked up with Jason because I went, this is not a lack of intent. No. And, and so what I've want to say is if if it said for me the financial management style across the authority supports financial sustainability at the moment i would say that we don't have that financial management style across the authority i just want to make the, the point um chair that this is, does not demonstrate a lack of intent and if i could just add to that the words on here are the sit that Words so yeah, below this, and I know <laughs> looking across the council, Chilcock, she raised the order. Can see there's quite a lot of detail below this that actually goes into what, what it actually means. I'm not sure on that one, the wording is necessarily the most helpful that how it's written, but that, that that's why we judged it in that way. Thank you. That's all from uh, League members and associate league members and councillor Chilcock. You've been named, so you automatically go to the top of the list. Oh. Uh, Mandy. Um, just to acknowledge the staff, first of all, as we've already done, and the accounts. And I have to say, being someone that's read all, probably, what we're looking at, 3,000 pages, probably, just to put it into context this year. It's been colossal, um, and um, but there have been some good conversations as well. So just following on from that and just picking up really the first bit of the report, whether 114... Uh, the, the comment around 114, it says that there is a likelihood that a section 114 notice will need to be issued in respect of 2526 unless there are significant changes to current forecasts. And I suppose what I was looking for in this strategy was how we were going to make those significant changes to forecast. 
who was going to be responsible for them and by when. You know, we all know with targets, you've got to have a date and a person responsible. And I suppose to a degree, I couldn't get that. There was a bit of a dump of everything that's going on, and it's a very busy paper um, and a lot to read. But for me, that that essence of, again, what message is it putting out to our public, to the readers of the report? I wasn't sure um, on reading it all. Lots of information, but what does it mean for the organisation? Coming back to um, the issues that we discussed and were discussed at audit, I think it's a real challenge, if you like, popping them into this paper, because there was a lot of discussion and debate behind them. And I'm not sure how helpful it is when you just cut and paste something into a paper. And I know something, um, if we look on pages 80 and 81, we've got two reds there, uh, which we very much focused on in the audit committee and what that actually meant. But what you don't get a sense of that those two reds represent two out of three of a major part of of what's been looked at here my question is um one of the issues with the fin financial management style um was about the feeding through of the budgets through the whole organization through everybody's plans from the top to the bottom so everybody will have different areas of responsibility for the budget which what they're looking at ultimately the directors but it will also feed into plans right across the organization and i think we heard that that sort of link to all of the plans wasn't as strong as it should be in this council so my question is when you combine that with the I'll call it turmoil of staffing that we're going to go through in the coming months. I don't have reassurance that with all that turmoil and that lack of strong control on the budgets right the way down the organisation, we are going to be able to meet our budgets. So I'm hoping someone can give me that assurance. I don't see how that's quite possible when I read this in combination with the, the staff structures and changes we're looking at. If I could just start, Chair, I, I, there, there are going to be <laughs> internal factors that we can control and there are going to be external factors that are beyond our control. I think what we will have through this summer is a much more extensive and tighter list of milestones that we need to meet as we go month by month from now until the um, revision of the MTFP in September. I think I thought this last year. This year we need to show much greater intent and determination to not let up on the pressure through the summer months. Because I know having worked in public sector for so many years, you normally, you get, you, you set your budget, you get your outturn, you start to breathe again, and then you pick it up again later. This year, there's not gonna be a break at all. So I've got my own personal milestones on my office wall at home, which are for me. Um, <laughs> and they're, they're gonna be tough, they are. So I, I don't know if you want to come in with detail, please, Jason. Yeah, so so in terms of those sort of forecasts, that, that's why I'm suggesting the report comes back in September. We have a dated picture of what, what they look like going forward, Mansi. In particular, you know, the, the pressures across the services need updating. I don't think, regardless of what happens when an election is of that, anything's going to change significantly in the funding that we receive. I think that's going to be fairly much what we've got now and what's in the sort of national forecasts. I don't think you'll see any fundamental changes there. So that September report back to the executive would be the key timetable. Um, one of the factors in here, though, actually it's tied into the national context, is how the capitalisation directions work. I think there is a problem <coughs> with how DLAC could do them. So we still have not had confirmation of our capitalisation direction yet. We're in April. I was told that'd be done in March. Well, not happened. Um, it doesn't impact upon us in terms of we do have sufficient reserves to deal with that. If I was to wind that on another year, that could be an issue. And Deluxe timetable could force us into a 114. 
hence that comment in the report. <laughs> so it's not just our own stuff. This this is also a bit of the national context as well. You're right in terms of the control stuff. It's going to be really important in an organisation going through fundamental change at quite high pace. We have to do it at high pace because we want the savings. We can't have it landing perfectly. We want to take out the significant savings we need to take out. I think it's really important why I'm suggesting the control boards are still in place and we continue with monthly budget monitoring. I think it, it's really important that we do those things. We can't eliminate all the risks of something falling down the gaps, but I think by having those fundamental sort of pillars and building blocks in there, it helps reduce it. Thank you. I just it was concerned around where those right those responsibilities lay, especially with the fast moving organisation, that that isn't lost, if you like, with all the other work and the staff changes we're having. And I think it'll be really challenging uh, for directors to keep on top of their budgets. That's the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mandy. I'm not seeing any other members indicating. Um, nobody online? No. OK, so just just to repeat uh, the huge appreciation to the finance team and to the audit committee for the massive amount of hard work with getting us through so many sets of accounts in in one year. It is hugely appreciated and really pleased to see um, the work that's ongoing, the spending boards and the monthly budgetary reports that will help us to stick with this and just reiterate the wider point about the broken system of local government finance, um, which I, I, we've been trying to work with our partners and other councils and through through other organisations to land this message with with future government um, and current government to try and try and uh, secure amelioration um, of the context that we're having to work. On. Anyway, to introduce the um, recommendations, so to approve the MTFS strategy for 25-26. Uh, to 2930 and the savings target for 2526 to council recommends the council continues with the aim of avoiding section 114 by taking necessary actions and continuing to operate as if one had been issued uh, received an updated mtfp in september 24 which sets the latest forecast for future service costs income and funding for 2526 to 2930 recommends the continued campaigning to reform funding of councils and to allow greater freedoms and to improve the financial control boards continue to operate in 24-25 as set out in appendix three okay can i have a proposer councillor lineshaw seconded councillor wakefield those in favor please those against that is clearly carried so we move on to item eight asset rationalization program Yeovil and West Somerset customer facing accommodation. Uh, the main no, no, no. report, colleagues, uh, does is not confidential, though the appendices do contain exempt in information that aren't for publication. If at any point we move on to that territory, we will have to exclude press and public. Okay. Um, so, Councillor Roswike to introduce, please. Thank you. This has been well signposted, this um, report. It's been in the making for many months uh, as consultations have occurred with um, ward members, parish councils, trade union staff, and there has been considerable co-production of um, the various elements of it as well. The outcome, as you can see in the paper, is something which um, highlights some of the concerns which have been addressed. It also recognises that this is something which is fundamentally makes sense in terms of office um, rationalisation, and it will be the first of several papers you'll get over the months as we rationalise our estate um, um, following the um, the bringing together of five councils and their assets. Um, it's been done with great care and attention, and hopefully that we'll end up with what is something for the local community will be a fabulous resource going forward for the future. Um, I'll hand over to um, members of the asset team who have been working on this project, but it has been across the whole of the um, council in terms of making sure 
all the services we provide to the population, first of all, in West Somerset um, are accommodated. And secondly, um, this is the first of probably several papers around office um, accommodation in Yeovil. But this is the first one where we're pulling together um, the um, public facing services of the library together with customer services and hopefully for the benefit of the community. I'll hand over to the officers. Is that, one? Is that microphone working? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, so as uh, Councillor Wyke has said, you, we want to talk to you about particularly two uh, projects included within the property rationalisation programme this morning for which we've been conducting feasibility studies. Those studies have now concluded and the recommendations that are contained within your report this morning have a, have the resulting recommendations from those studies. Um, so just by way of a quick background, we know that a combination of post-COVID working and um, the bringing together of the five authorities into one has resulted in an oversupply of office accommodation. And so we've been reviewing that with an aim to reduce, co-locate, fully utilise the buildings that we retain um, in order to generate those capital receipts and revenue savings from reduced running costs. Um, the projects we're talking to you about this morning are both included in the medium term financial plan. Um, there are target revenue savings of 425,000 over two years from this year for these projects, um, and we are confident that we will achieve those savings and, and possibly even surpass them. Um, as we go through reviewing properties from a property rationalisation perspective, we're not just looking at the kind of obvious where do we want to put our staff, but we're also considering things like energy efficiency, decarbonisation potential, condition of buildings, but also the future operating needs of the council. And we think at the moment with so much work going on to, to reduce and right size the organisation, Actually, the needs of our estate are still a little bit uncertain, so it's important to us that we invest in properties that provide a degree of flexibility. Um, and that's very much been taken into consideration as we if we move through the feasibility studies that we're going to talk to you about today. Um, so the first of the projects is in Yeovil Town Centre and it involves two properties, Yeovil Library and Petter's House. The library is the current home of both the library and registration services and Petter's House was historically the customer service provision for the Old South Somerset District Council and the Housing Advice Service. So the feasibility study that we conducted there was looking at can we co-locate all of those services into one location in Yeovil Town Centre so that customers are accessing all of our services from one location. Um, we have had very heavy involvement from all of the services impacted. The line managers form part of the uh, project team. We took detailed requirements from all services from the outset and they formed part of the design brief for the library building. Um, as we've moved through and drawn up draft plans based on those requirements, we've also then engaged with staff to share those plans, to seek their input, to provide the opportunity to make recommendations that we may not already have considered. Uh, and we gave um, staff members a couple of weeks to look at those and feedback through a generic email box um, so that we could make sure that we were considering everything that staff thinks were important to them. Um, we also undertook public engagement. So we issued a survey to the customer panel and there were um, social, various social media activities. That survey was shared on social media. And I think the common themes of feedback for the library were concern over the, the very differing services that would be co-located. So you've got everything from housing advice to children's and families using a library um, to people perhaps registering births, deaths, etc. So it's quite a challenge in that space. But what we've also done as part of the project is sought advice from security professionals around how can we make that space fit for purpose, but also protect the varying groups. So the, the plans have actually centred the, the customer service provision on the ground floor of the library nearest to the door so that if there are any concerns or poor behaviour, we can actually very quickly eject customers without impacting the rest of the users of the building. Um, and as we've quite rightly been, been told by our library's colleagues, they already 
serve those customers anyway. People say you can't you can't possibly put homeless customers in a library. Homeless people already use a library for a number of reasons. And I think we have to to disperse that here and say that actually what we're trying to do is provide better service to our customers. Why should they have to, to access two different sites in one location for, for one service? So uh, for, for one authority. So the library's customers, the registration team, the staff understand why we are trying to do this. They accept it's been a challenge, but through the consideration of the feedback, the review of security, we are confident that any concerns that have been addressed have been allayed. Um, in terms of customer feedback, I think the key themes were more around, is this going to reduce the service provision at all? Is this going to reduce the book stops at the library? The answer to both of those questions is no. Um, the floor area that we are looking to do most of the work to isn't currently used for book stocks, um, so there will be no reduction and all of the groups that currently operate out of the library. So we have children's groups, we have well-being things, people can use blood pressure monitors, there are yoga classes, all of that can continue to run. So this will not result in any reduction of service delivery whatsoever, um, but it will just mean that customers are accessing one location. Um, I don't know if you want me to pause there on Yeovil before we go into West Somerset. Is that helpful to answer any questions? Are there any immediate questions on specifically on Yeovil? Um, well, Joe first, and then I will bring you in as a local member. Thank you. Joe. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I want to talk about the Yeovil Library. I have had a chat with Sarah and she's assured me that a lot of work has gone on about the security because that's something that worries me. I've been at Petter's house on many occasions when there have been unhappy clients in there and I am concerned that we protect the rest of the members of the public because it is is there only one entrance in and out of here? And also, um, I think it would be helpful if we could have had some key for the, from the floor plan so that we could actually see what is happening where, because it isn't very clear from here. But I, I am concerned about the security, and I think that we need to be very careful how this is handled. And, and I would like to, to see... Um, what is going where more clearly on from the plan we have here with, with, with some diagrams and the access really clearly defined because if somebody is kicking off the entrance, what is going to happen to all the people on all the other floors in this building? Um, it is, a, I find that a worry. And do we have another exit where people could go if there is a really serious problem? Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Sorry, were you happy to be that loud? Yep, happy to do that. Um, so, so what we've done with the access, historically, if you, you call, you go into the library and you turn immediately left to access the main library floor, but in front of you are fire control doors. We've liaised with our fire services officers to confirm that we can actually open those doors so the public that need to access the library would go straight ahead through the stairwell into the library. They would not have to go through the area that would be used for that customer service provision. We're also going to amend the door so that it's a sliding door. So the logic that we can do is if a customer needs to be ejected and ejected quickly, they can come through that side door, which is the original front door and straight out, whereas the rest of the library customers would access and exit through the stairwell area. We also have um, a further exit door, which is through a staff area, but we are able to use that takes us out to the sort of back of the library behind the old Dennis building, if you can picture. Thank you. Did you have a yes, brief picture? Yes. I, I just feel that this is everybody in the same place coming and going, because if you get outside, and there is still a problem, you are going to be within the vicinity of what potentially could be people shouting, screaming, throwing themselves around. We don't know. Is it possible to put in an exit in a completely different area so that people could get out away from the front entrance if there was a problem? So we, we can't construct 
an additional exit over what's there. We have looked into that, but where we've just decarbonised that building, we have actually kind of blocked the only parts of walls that that would be feasible to do so. But what we have established as well is the second you come out the front of the library, you're straight into the area that's picked up by the sound town centre CCTV and they're able to track customers. So what would happen is they would be alerted if there was an issue and they would track that customer with, so security would eject them and stay with them whilst the town centre cameras tracked it. During that period of time, whilst we're dispersing that, we have two options, which is to encourage people to stay within the building or to exit via the other exit. But it's kind of, it's quite similar really at the moment to when people do get ejected from Petters and, and I've worked in that building myself for 10 years and it is quite challenging. But actually what we found is that relationship with the town centre CCTV is, is a very good one. It's trusted and they supported with a number of issues. So we've got every confidence that we can manage it. But let's not, it will be tricky at times because the nature of customers, we can't manage people's behaviour, unfortunately, but there is enough thought and experience in how we will manage that situation and relevant um, risk assessments will be drawn process as well. Thank you for that reassurance, Sarah. And Faye, do you want to, just on the Yeovil question? Yeah, I've got no comment on the West Somerset, but um, from, from the Yeovil point of view, I'd just like to thank the team for, for the engagement that they've had with us as local members. It doesn't happen with a lot of decisions that are happening, so I'm really grateful for the input that we've had. Um, personally, I think that anything that integrates as much of our, um, as many of our residents into our facilities as we can is a good thing. Um, the idea of having to segregate people because they have challenges, um, whether they be housing or, or mental health or whatever else, it strikes me as the wrong approach for us as a council. So I welcome the fact that we're trying to be as, inclu as inclusive as possible. Um, and I also welcome the fact that we've got the right risk um, um, mitigations in place as well. I know the building very well and I can that was very easy to to visualize. Thank you very much. Um, my ask would be firstly thank you for keeping stuff within the town centre. I think one of the the worst things that happened to Yeovil was the council offices being built on the outside outside of town and everybody being out there. We don't have the footfall from the staff within the town centre. So anything we can do to keep that stuff happening in the town centre, I welcome. And my ask would be, I think Councillor White said there's some more stuff coming forward for Yeovil buildings. And I hope that that will mean that the town centre will be the focus because both transport and access to Brimpton Way have been a challenge for my whole life. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you mentioned, there are things that are in the pipeline. We have got funding both for last year and particularly in this year to do a development plan, a master plan for the whole of the town, because I think that's we need to move away from piecemeal to actually looking at the total picture. And we are spending and investing a lot of money in Yobo and we need to get it right. And so I'm glad you welcome that. Thank you. And I would welcome local member engagement on that. Thank you. Absolutely. OK, do we want to carry on with the West? Yep. Oh, Adam, sorry, did you want to come on the Oval? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just just to agree with uh, Faye's point, but actually I think it's great to be able to have um, officers in town. One, as the former South Somerset councillors, that was, that was one of the biggest issues for people who couldn't drive actually to get to the council offices. And I'd very much welcome uh, uh, move, moving of them offices, if possible, into the centre and actually selling off Brimpton Way. And I know Travel Lodge in the past has uh, been interested in buying off us. So uh, I'd be very interested to see us going down that uh, route at some point. I'm, I'm sure that will be uh, for, for another day. If we could move on to Wests. Um, hey, thank you very much. Um, if we can move on to West Somerset uh, House, please. Yep. OK, so West Somerset was perhaps like a slightly different um, proposition in that we had more than one option there. We considered, do we uh, retain West Somerset House and dispose of the other buildings or do we uh, do the flip side of that and retain the three smaller buildings and dispose of West Somerset House? So the feasibility study here looked at those two options and the viability of each of them. Um, I think the, the reason for the recommendation that's before you, which is to retain West Somerset House is based around two key areas. The first is around flexibility of the accommodation. So the three smaller buildings do not offer us any flexibility as the needs of the organisation change and adapts as we move forward. Um, would have had very little, if 
if no opportunity of using those buildings or adding people into those buildings, it would have been very, very difficult. Uh, and also retaining things like polling station for the elections and um, meeting space, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other thing that become a key consideration is the condition and decarb potential of the buildings in that West Somerset House is much more thermally efficient. It, uh, although it hasn't been decarbed, it can be quite simply. Um, and and the energy performance rating of the building is is better than the others. So obviously that's an important consideration for us. And finally, the condition of each of those buildings, the smaller buildings require much more backlog maintenance spend than the retention of West Somerset House. So when you look at the kind of financial business case, taking aside that ability to flex the building, actually the finances all add up to say that West Somerset provides us, West Somerset House provides the better option there. Um, so what I would say is there, where West Somerset is more of a challenge for us, so you'll see from the report that we've had quite a lot of um, engagement with members as a result of the consultation stage here. Uh, and members understand we are very concerned about any loss or reduction in service provision. Um, we have engaged extensively with all of the services, both from the designing of the space to the feedback we've received, and they give us complete reassurance that there will be no loss or reduction of provision of services to that currently offered. Um, we also had uh, a lot of feedback about meeting space and the importance of meeting space to members in that area, and that was something that we you know, felt we couldn't overlook. So the proposal, the, the amendments that we've made to the plans following that feedback is to allow a flexible meeting space on the first floor of the building. It's not possible to retain it in the current area because that's an area we want to utilise for children's services and that space is used all day every day um, and by children and families and we cannot bring babies, small families through a staff area. Whereas to use that as flexible meeting space, we can separate it from the rest of the building and share the facilities successfully. So that would allow us to use that space for uh, LCN meetings, other meetings, training space, collaboration space, election periods, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a flexible use of space on the first floor to ensure that we're meeting those member concerns around meeting space. Um, the, the other point that's been picked up, and it is outside the scope of this project, unfortunately, is around the customer service provision at West Somerset House. So we are aware that our colleagues in the customer access and operations team are undertaking a review at the moment of customer service provision. That is a separate piece of work to this project, but we have engaged them and made it clear that we, you know, we want to understand their needs. What they've said is it will be, you know, in theory, one of two options. The current customer facing traditional reception style or the more digitally assisted customer access point. They have not yet confirmed which route that will go down because that consultation is still ongoing. But what we have assured them is whatever outcome of that review, we can meet their space requirement. We are simply waiting to hear what that looks like. And that's not something we're able to comment further on today. Um, but it's just really to reassure that as soon as we know the outcome, we will we will reflect that adequately and accurately in the plans. Um, for both of the projects we've indexed, so we, as we said, there is a confidential paper, but just to sort of give reassurance that in terms of the project costs, we have indexed them to quarter three of 2024, allowing for BCIS uplift, because we're conscious that one of the biggest risks is not knowing how the market's going to perform when we go out to tender for the works. So we've tried to mitigate that risk by uplifting the project costs. Um, and I think really that's the key things I wanted to say. So again, happy to take questions. Thank you, Sarah. So any questions from leader associate members on this one? Not. Oh, Sarah, first of all. I'm just looking at the layouts and I probably missed something. <clears throat> I probably wasn't listening properly. In the Yeovil one, that's got a customer service desk there, has it? And if it has, where is it? Because I can't see that. I think on the, the one for West Somerset, you've got names on it saying what they're going to be used for. So how it works in, in Yeovil, and it works the same at Petters at the moment, is it's not a desk as such. It's a almost like a podium where customers are received as they come in. They're triaged to see what their requirements are, and then they're taken to the relevant area of the building to assist. So that might be a private interview room. It might be taken to a public network computer to be digitally assisted, or it may just be taken to a booth 
so semi-private to, to then go further into detail. So it's not a traditional reception desk, the way customer service provision is moving away from that a little bit more. Hey, got well, Mandy in the room and then Rosemary online. So Mandy first. Um, where to start? Um, I think it's fair to say there have been lots of forward and going forward and back over the last um, couple of weeks, really. Um, and what I say, I hopefully say, because we will have more of these going on around the county. So I hope it's uh, said in that context of improving perhaps a little bit when you go on to the, the next area. So I think the whole process started really, really well, and it was probably nine months, 12 months ago. We had um, a really great session um, and looking at West Somerset was discussed openly. I think since that time, it's all been pretty quiet. And I think for the councillors in West Somerset, and I speak for more than just myself, really the next we heard much about it was the paper's arrival. Um, and we've talked a lot about the needs of the council and the services. My concern is this is actually about the needs of the people that we serve um, and it's about the needs of the third sector and other organisations and groups. And I'll include businesses because there's a business units in West Somerset. And for me, those needs have not all been met. I don't think there have been discussions. I know with one um, group that used the uh, one of the buildings, they have not had conversations. Uh, they've not been asked to look at the space. Does it fulfil their requirements and needs? That has not happened. And I find that disappointing. Um, I've also actually been in contact with Liv Leishon. And, and for me, and I was talking to Lee about it earlier, there's this triple impact, if you like, that one of the main organisations in West Somerset, and I won't use their name, they were using one of the other buildings we don't know if their needs will be met within the plans for this building they have also had an increase in rent in another area and we've withdrawn their grant so my concern probably beyond this paper is when we are looking at our not only ourselves we have to look at our third sector that do great work for us and where there's more than one effect on our third sector so this is one impact but there are other impacts the councils are having as well. So I think that's a piece of work the council needs to do when we are looking at really key organisations that are being hit from several angles for this council. I don't think that's a piece of work that's been uh, done, Chair. So for me, the building is still missing elements. I really, really think you needed to have a get together of the local councillors. We were told, for example, initially they didn't know that LCN meetings were held there. I think it's a major concern that we might lose that face to face in West Somerset. And I know all about the other interactions we can have, but sometimes people need to speak to somebody. And I think if that whole provision is lost in West Somerset, I think that would be detrimental. Given we were an opportunity area, we've got real challenges with transport. I think if that is pulled from West Somerset, I think that will be detrimental to the area and we've already got people traveling a lot of miles to perhaps pick up papers sign papers mm -hmm. drop in id etc so i think there are still some missings i really would have welcomed an open dialogue with all of your local councillors and i think actually we could have ironed out some of these mm -hmm. before it headed into a paper so mm -hmm. that's my feedback for you okay Thank you for the feedback. I think there was a there were a number of points in that, and I just wonder whether there may be similar points from um, Rosemary and Francis. And maybe we'll take them collectively. So if we go move to Rosemary online. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just I picked up from Councillor Chilcott that the customer service space was moving from the what is now the reception area. And that does worry me because we have no end of elderly people that use that. And to say that you're going to use it as a digital space, that's not something that would be welcomed, especially by the elderly. And I didn't pick it up on the drawings that came to me last, but Councillor Chilcott had, which I, I'm very grateful to Mandy for that. But 
I would love more discussion on this. I feel it's a great use of the of the West Somerset House because it has been underused for a great for a long time, because when I was on the district council, it was being underused and we were thinking about combining the library and other services there. And this has gone down that road. I know that the business use that is being done hasn't been fully you know, discussed. And I think if the council meet with those business users, they might find that they'll have the problem might be taken off their hands, but I can't guarantee that. But I think a discussion with those people would be welcome. Thank you. And um, go to Francis next. Uh, yes, much on the same same theme. Um, I'm concerned. I, I am concerned. At, I understand the reasons behind the loss of a proper meet, council meeting room in West Somerset. Um, I am nevertheless extraordinarily disappointed that the whole of that huge area will have no proper council chamber. It's been something which was use of, was promised in various iterations of councils since the first amalgamation of West Somerset and Taunton Dean. Um, I can see that it is now past praying for, but I am particularly concerned that the upstairs space, which is to be provided, will be big enough for what's needed. Um, I don't know about other people's LCNs, but we have 40 or 50 people at ours on Exmoor. Um, I hope that it's big enough to take that and would welcome reassurance. Um, and that would also be big enough for a scrutiny committee, et cetera, or even a planning committee. And I would, would welcome um, a reassurance on that. I am concerned equally about the face-to-face -face, uh, question and feel very strongly that while it is not the decision in this paper, mm. um, the message needs to go back that that uh, conversations with all the local members of West Somerset uh, and with the public are important. Again, it is a very huge area with very poor for uh, access to um, uh, to uh, public um, bodies. Um, and that my third uh, thing that I'm echoing is um, I'm I am concerned for an area which is where employment is really difficult, that if we are displacing people from business premises, we make every effort to support them to find something else rather than saying, oh, well, they can find something else, which is rather what it felt like. Support is, is and, and the third, the, the, the last one is that most of our services to people in West Somerset of the early help variety are not done by us, they're done by other people. And we absolutely need to make sure we don't just, they can find somewhere for themselves or, oh, well, it'll be all right because we've told them it's all right. Uh, we've really got to put some effort into making sure that they really are all right. Thank you very much. So much more, all, all on the same subjects. I, I, I anticipated that all three, three, three comments might be, might have a similar theme to them. Um, just just remind you of what the, this this paper does and doesn't do, which is 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 about the the, the, the reallocation of space rather than than the resource. And and wouldn't it have been wonderful if there'd been space for 110 members in Willerton and we could have had all our council meetings in Willerton. Um, however, um, um, that wasn't possible. I do do, do note on the diagram there's space for 60, which I think should be should be sufficient for all purposes that I can anticipate. Um, if it needed more than that, then 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 I'm sure we would need to need to look wider. Um, did you want to make another point? Yes, thank you very much. I, I think that wasn't in the plans until the West Somerset members uh, talked about it loudly. Um, the uh, uh, the only point I absolutely appreciate what the paper is about, but this is one council. The implications of this paper need to be taken up uh, by other parts of this council. And what's said here, I hope, will be passed on to those people who are dealing with the implications. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. That, that, that is understood. Um, Councillor White. Thank you. And thank you for your comments. Um, first of all, for um, my colleagues who don't know, um, West Somerset House is a modern building. It's been hugely underutilised for a long, long time. And what we're proposing is actually to make it a sustainable long-term facility for um, West Somerset. 
And I, I think that anybody looking at it from afar would see that we're actually making sure that of the adjacent buildings, and two out of the three buildings we're talking about are literally steps away from West Somerset House. So we're not actually relocating um, the nursery for miles. It's probably as near as anybody delivering a child to the nursery could deliver to um, West Somerset House. It's so two of the buildings are very close. The third one is the Enterprise Centre. And I, when I went to visit it, um, I think earlier this year, it there was only one firm using it. It is again being one which has been difficult to fully rent over the years, but it doesn't mean to say that in the future there won't be needs. But that has been accommodated within the building. And as with enterprise centres, we do continually monitor them to make sure that local businesses are supported. Historically, they have not wanted to use this building. We do, however, have businesses who'd like to take the whole building over. So it's not as if we're going to um, say that it won't be used for commercial use in the future. So um, that's there. But coming back to your concerns, the space which on the first floor is a very flexible space. Yes, it can take an LCN meeting. Yes, it can take a planning meeting. Yes, it can be used for other things because if you want a sustainable future for this council, we're going to have to use, learn to use our space in many different ways. We can't afford to have a council chamber sitting empty for 95% um, of the week. So what we've done is got a, a proposal in front of you, which is flexible, which will accommodate the needs of the local community and will be sustainable in the long run. Because what we're trying to do with re office realisation or rationalisation is to look to the future. Because the last thing we want is to remove resources from some of the outlying communities. And what you've got in front of you is a proposal which does provide long-term sustainable use in a building, which is going to be, again, environmentally a lot more, more lot easier to maintain and improve its environmental conditions and um, environmental status going forward as well. So I appreciate change is always difficult, but we've got what we need and this is the essence of what what unitary was all about which i heard um people talk about at great length on on platforms so we're now delivering what we we would have expected from the um post vesting day activities of the council so i commend this paper i don't know have i missed anything you want to add to it yeah, uh, thank you, Councillor White. I think just to come back on a couple of a couple of the points that have been made. Firstly, um, Councillor Chilcott, uh, we recognise that more could always be done on on consultation and engagement. I think you're right to make the point that there was a, we got off to a good start. There was probably a gap there. Thankfully, I think because of a lot of effort that's gone in over the last two or three weeks, we've heard the points that have been made, changes have been made. That is what the local member consultation part of the decision making process is for. So I think we have hopefully caught the issues. And I hope that you've had assurances today and we'll go on and provide some more detail on that. But um you know the, the concerns that have been raised have been addressed. But I do take the point that we could always do more um and perhaps that's a lesson that we will take back for for for, for further um uh, reviews. I, I would say I think my team are working across a very broad front at the moment and unfortunately we are getting to the point where there just isn't the time and the office to capacity to do what we would want to do with um, local member engagement but I think in this case it, it's it's um, you know it, it's something we will try and correct going forward. Um, I think assurance has been provided with the meeting room. I think the points have been well made that there's, there's a good capacity there and it is a flexible space that is part of breathing life into a building that's been underused for, for many years. Um, uh, there is nothing, you know, we have assurances from services that there is nothing we are doing as part of this property rationalisation project that 
will impact on the ability of the current occupants, be they our own services or uh, commissioned services from third sector organisations, that the spaces that are being designed within West Somerset House are suitable and flexible for all of those needs. And we have that. Um, we have had a lot of dialogue with officers in children's services in particular and library staff uh, to make sure that we're confident on that point. But we will carry on. Um, thanks for raising those concerns and we will engage with the organisation that you're talking about. We'll make sure that commissioners are. Um, I think the points about customer services, uh, Councillor Nicholson has recognised that that's not really for this room, but we will take those back and make sure they're highlighted with the relevant officers looking at that. Um, issue and just finally on um, engagement with local businesses at the enterprise center we, we're in active conversations with those those two businesses we have been for some time we are offering space suitable space um that we that we think we can make work at west somerset house but there are other options being explored and that, that dialogue is well underway so hopefully that provides some reassurance on that that was always the case it probably just didn't come out in the report um but as I say, we, we will take away the, the lesson around um, you can't do enough engagement with local community representatives and we and we do appreciate the work that you've put in over the last few weeks to kind of shape this um, and, and help us to understand the issues. Thank you. Mandy, you just wanted to come back briefly. Very, very quickly, just to say, first of all, for the avoidance of doubt, I absolutely welcome change. I welcome the building being used and fully utilised. I mm -hmm. never said anything to the contrary, um, and I welcome the work you've done. The reason my comments were made is there's been a lot of toing and froing over the last couple of weeks, and I really thank you for that. Probably a quarter of an hour online with your local councillors would have probably saved you a lot of that time. And that was the reason why I have mentioned that I'm about making things better when you go on to the next project. So I hope it's taken in that vein. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I think the point the point's been been well made. OK, if we move on to the recommendation. Um, so first of all, just to thank uh, Sarah and Ollie and all the team for your hard work on this. Um, it is appreciated. And I think the points about local member engagement are well made and um, we will we'll, 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 we'll do, do, do our best to make sure that uh, that uh, we, we do it even be better in the future. I think there's been some really good local member engagement. It's perhaps not happened in the right right way at times, but the, the, the world isn't perfect and you learn you learn no, to, to, to move forwards. Um, Sorry, Councillor Woods, did you want to say something? No. No, OK, would you like to go on to mute, please? Thank you. Um, so uh, we have a, a recommendation to relocate services from Petters House, Yeovil to Yeovil Library, to relocate services from Willerton Children's Centre, Willerton Library and Beckett House to West Somerset House, and to delegate authority to Service Director, Strategic Asset Management and Consultation with the lead member for Economy Planning and Assets to appoint professional services as required, go to tender evaluation and wood contracts up to £700,000 in line with the approved capital bids to make layout changes in Yeovil Library and West Somerset House to facilitate the co-location of services. Agree the case for Appendix B to be regarded as exempt information and be treated in confidence as the case for the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information and we haven't needed to exclude the press and public so we don't need recommendation five. Do I have a proposal for that Councillor Wild? Like a seconder from Councillor Wilkins. Those in favour please and those against that is clearly carried. Um, I believe that's all our business for today. So um, I advise you that our next scheduled executive meeting is 8th of May, which will again be here in the John Meekle room. Thank you very much for your attendance and contribution. Declare the meeting closed. Thank you. <laughs>